you're only black in the United States. If we go to Africa, we're from whatever tribe we're, what are you, Yorubu, what, what is mm -hmm. it, Yoruba? Mm -hmm. No one's black in Africa. Mm -hmm. You're from your, you're what tribe you are. Yeah. People of European descent that came here as immigrants, they were not white. They were Irish, they were French, they were German. They weren't white until they, until they started buying in to the caste system. Then they became white. Otherwise, they were just as low level immigrants as we were, just they came freely versus mm -hmm. being brought. I mean, I'm telling you, it was like, whoa. <laughs> so how can all these people from other nations that are not Americans, because none of us are American, you know, Native Americans. Yeah, we're, not, we're not the indigenous right. people. All these other people were what, what they were until they came to America. Then they became white. And then, then they could see and start treating people that were brown beneath them because it's it's a natural order of the psyche that someone will have to be you know someone's got to be at the bottom of the rung someone's got to be at the top but we were deemed at the bottom only because you were born that way Hey everybody, this is Garrett and Sita coming to you with another edition of Idea to Invention, a podcast for inventors and small businesses. And uh, I'm Garrett. Your boy. And I'm Sita. That's Sita over there. I'm crunching on almonds, I'm sorry. And so um, we're going to tackle a uh, sensitive subject, sensitive matter. Um, One wipe or two. <laughs> oh, Lord. That is a sensitive subject. <laughs> Them bears on that commercial kill me. <laughs> on the Charmin commercial? Yes. They're naked all the time, and they're talking about wiping. <laughs> is that what you... <laughs> what intrigues you? Yeah, they're talking about, don't they? My hiney's clean, so my underwear's clean. But you're naked. You're... <laughs> Well, they got the underwear on the floor. Remember, they're like, I'm not going to pick it up. You well, pick it right, up. you pick it up. But <laughs> then, er, up. then dad's walking around naked because he don't have one. <laughs> I don't get it. Do they think we're not, they don't know, they didn't think that we don't know that they're naked. <laughs> I think you're diving a little I'm sorry. too deep. That was. Into a Sherman commercial. That was. A Sherman commercial. But not the sensitive subject that we're talking about. No, it's not. Uh, we're going to talk about the. Uh, the elephant in the room, social injustice. Is it really an elephant? Well, some cases, some some rooms. Some folks don't want to talk about it. Well, not in this room. No. So, um, unfortunately, we are in another uh, situation where an unarmed black man has been uh, shot, gunned down by... Uh, police officer in uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, our hearts go out to uh, Jacob Blake's family in, in, in this time. And, um, and I, from what I under, <clears throat> understand that he's still in the hospital and uh, in critical condition. And so we, as of this, uh, this broadcast, we, we're, we're praying that he has a, a recovery and he pulls through and um, <clears throat> but this has led to another spike of, uh, of, of protests and um, in regards to the social injustice that has been plaguing our country uh, for years and, and, um, and it's really uh, coming to a head. And so uh, right now, because of, because of that situation, the NBA, um, uh, yesterday evening, they postponed um, you know, playoff games, uh, as well as the WNBA, uh, Major League Baseball. Um, tennis players had, had begun to say that they weren't going to play. And, um, and uh, trying to 
send a message that, uh, um, you know, sports is a, is a privilege and, and, and a gift. And, and so, and, and until uh, justice is, is seen and action is, is, is seen, you know, they're like, okay, well, we're going to take that gift away. Well, <clears throat> here's the thing. You know, I can always go back to slavery. That's my thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know. <laughs> Shouldn't give me a book, because then I'm going to find out. Or once it's like, once you have somebody like reveal it, it's like, are you kidding me? Never thought about it like that. So the book I've been listening to, not reading, because I don't like to read, is Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know exactly what I was, um, what, I didn't know what caste was. Yeah. Nor the caste system or anything like that. And what she's doing is she's comparing racism to casteism. And racism, we're not, what we say is racism you need to peel back the layers and actually it's casteism. And one of the points that she made in the book is slaves were not allowed to do anything for their slave masters except for entertain them, which was, you know, through music, mm -hmm. dance, or um, of the such, or made them to not play games, but participate in like games for entertainment for them. Mm -hmm. But that was the only thing that they were allowed to do. So the fact that people of color, the only industry where they are on top is the athletic industry and the entertainment industry, where we have more people of color that make the most amount of money. Because mm -hmm. when you think about, you know, in terms of the owners of the stadium, which go back to, sorry, I knew that was coming, excuse me. The owners of the sta stadiums, the leader of industries like um, e-com, stuff like that. When you talk about the percentage, how many of the wealthiest people on the globe are, how many percentage of them are color? Of, co of color mm -hmm. and then you get to the industry the only two the industries that go all the way back from slavery that people of color were allowed to do those just happen to be the same two um, industries now where we have the most influence and control a lot of money mm -hmm. so you might not own the team you might not own the stadium, but those players, if they decide to stop playing collectively, yeah. then stuff will be done because then you're hurting that bottom line, point blank. They can't fire all of y'all, <laughs> but if you, all of you stop playing collectively, and really, I mean, in all honesty, I would think, and maybe this is my ignorance, I would think that if they miss some games, Financially, they're not, they're not going, it's not like my, the bus driver that's going, you know, if he ain't on his route, he ain't going to make rent that, you know, that month. So I would think collectively that they know that there's power, the, the power in numbers type of thing. So the entertainment industry was shut down by COVID. Mm-hmm. So there's no concerts, there's no, you know, you can't do that right now. Yep. But if, like, what's happening with the NBA and the WNBA just deciding, okay, we're not going to play. How is that going? That's going to disrupt something to the point where the people who do control, because all of the, all the money is coming from watching these, the, 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 the concessions, the, the endorsements, 
everything else is flowing from these players doing what they do. Mm -hmm. So if that if they stop, that's going to affect the powers mm -hmm. that are above collecting the money from what they do. Right. But the powers above are the ones that really can affect can make change from the players collectively saying, I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, I can imagine, Colin, go ahead. No, I was going to ask, uh, I mean, how long do you think that that has to? To go on? To go on for, the, Until, for, 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 those, for those at the top of the cycle or the food chain to say, okay, I'm going to make this call or I'm going to, um, I'm going to do something to help or make a change, to help make a change. I don't know how long it takes for their bottom line to be hurt, but that's what it would take. A one game sit out, that's not going to do it. One season sit out, that may not even do it. But the thing is, the longer, the longer they are determined to sit until something changes, it's, it's, a, it's literally going to be a power of the wills, but I think the, per, the players don't realize how much power they have. Because just like when, and I, I know this may sound racist as all get out, but, <laughs> well, that's not typically me. Um, when President Trump was trying to close the border, build a wall around Mexico and all that foolishness, which he probably didn't even realize how big the, the border is. But if collectively, if every single Hispanic person that supports any service in his, any of his hotels, establishments, casinos, or whatever, decided not to show up to work, mm. I can guarantee you that foolish talk would have been over with. Don't cut a lawn, don't show up to work, don't, don't, don't do anything that supports his empire. And you know, guaranteed, there are plenty of people of, that are brown oh, yeah. that support yeah. Oh, yeah. his empire. Yeah. Yeah. But collectively, just one day to see, don't, never, everybody just don't show up and see how that hurts his bottom line. Then... That's when eyes begin to, when you hurt their pocket, that's when things start to change. And my thing is, even after George Floyd, I mean, look, T-shirt, T-shirt, who, the fact that we're wearing stuff like this mm -hmm. should give people pause. You know what I mean? That it's like. But why, why doesn't it give them pause? because we've become immune to it. We've learned to, and that's what that book, the book, the cast, cast mm -hmm. really does explain of how we have been brainwashed to determine human value on arbitrary characteristics that no one can control. You can't control the color of your eyes. You can't control how tall you grow. You can't control the, the, the pigment or how dark or how light you are. But yet, in India and in America, because of that caste system, we've taught the world how to see us. Mm. So no matter what, if all three of us were standing in this room, automatically, because Alex is the lighter, com Alex, I don't know who he is, Isaac is <laughs> the lighter complexion of all of us, mm -hmm. somebody that didn't know would automatically assume he's the one who owns the spot, he's the one who's running it, because we've been so brainwashed, mm -hmm. and the thing that, and I, I, I do encourage everybody to listen to cast or read it when you look when you get the book it's a thick book 
it's an intimidating looking book. <laughs> but when you listen to it, you cannot get past. I mean, you cannot put it down. But one of the things that got me was, I mean, and everything in there, she cites fact for it, okay? Yeah. That the Nazis used how America placed value on slaves and determining keeping what race pure and all that eugenics and all that stuff they used the american system of slavery as the blueprint for nazi germany and even a lot of the stuff that they thought was too much would not they that's a little too far they were like no nah, that's 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 just too much we're not going to implement that part of it because we're not that barbaric and it's like I had no, no, when you, when you hear stuff like that, because you know America has painted Russia and Germany and all that to be like sadists of how they treated the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. But to know they got their blueprint from America and how the colonists treated the slaves, that just, and then it's like, you know what? And we're still 400 years later. Yeah. Dealing with the same issues. The fact that I have to show a t-shirt that yeah. is saying I can't breathe. And you see pictures from the 60s, the 50s and 60s of white police officers with their knee on the neck of a black woman. So why is it shocking that it still happens now? It's sad that it's still happening now. It's ridiculous that it's still happening now. And it's ridiculous even, um, you know, like the example that I give about us three being in the room, it doesn't take a white person to walk in here and think that he's in charge. Another black person will walk mm -hmm. in here and think that he's in charge. Not that you're not in charge. Either. We know you're in charge. Because <laughs> <laughs> he can shut it down right now. <laughs> But it's how we've just been, been programmed. programmed and brainwashed to think that arbitrary, arbitrary characteristics, and characteristics and traits determine your value. And the fact that, you know, that like she said, like she put in there that the fact that this is what brown people, Negroes were allowed to do hmm. as slaves. Why is it a shock that? Those are the industries that we thrive in, that we can literally go from nothing right, to. Right. And my thing is, so this, how do we use that power? Well, yeah, I guess that, that's, that's the question of how, how do we utilize that power? But the thing is, you got to recognize it. You got to recognize it first. If you don't recognize that you have that power, you're never going to use it. You'll never use it. And even there was something that came on the news this morning or something I was listening to. And she was like, even down to the fact of TV shows. Who is always, I mean, it's totally fed to us all the time, constantly, mm -hmm. even in our um, subconscious. You got a commercial on TV for a movie that are, who's the bad guy? And then we don't take offense to that. Like, one of my favorite shows is uh, Chicago PD. And then it took, it dawned on me, you know what? I never see, I mean, one, majority of the, black, well, there's one black cop. That's it. One at, at Latina. At, at, a Chicago, at Chicago PD? Come on now. <laughs> Come on. And dealing with the West Side and right. the South Side issues. You and it's a whole bunch black. of, right. You only got one black dude yeah, and one, you know, um, kind of ambiguous looking brown girl mm -hmm. but every single criminal criminal yep almost 90 percent of the and it's a tv show this is not based on a real story you know <laughs> it's, it's not that and it's like and this is happening in 2020 but that doesn't shock us that doesn't call for you know what this this tv show should be taking off the networks because of what it's representing and telling what it's feeding to the public. Mm -hmm. We don't think that, we don't see that as a problem. That's a problem. 
Do we not see it as a problem because we're, we're desiring to be entertained as well? Of course. We as brown people value the entertainment aspect and see, more I don't than know. we do the narrative that's being sent by, like, say, Chicago PD. and the I think that's world. everybody. I think that's everybody. What do you guys think about Tyler Perry? There's so much to say there. What do you mean? What, what, right. What, what do you mean? As far as the content that he puts out? What he represents. What does he represent? Let me ask that. I don't know as much just because from what I've seen a couple of clips is like he wants to change that view. That narrative? Narrative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think the, the people in that industry that are billionaires can do that. But they have to be willing to sacrifice for some relationships, sacrifice some dollars, because not everybody is going to be ready. But I, I, th I think he, but if you look at his content, his content is trying to change the narrative. Oh, no, I get it. But it can only be done in teaspoonfuls. No, I think he's unapologetically going through it. I'm telling you. I think it's, I think it's, um, and he, I'm cause, not Because he's found the network. He's, he's found a network that's going to, that, that will show his content. Right. But, and I know, but it's not all at once. It's not like he was like, he could, it has to be done in tolerable batches in order for somebody to be like, whoa, you know what? Uh-uh. But that's why, he, that's why he's in, in the point of trying to control his own. I know. So he doesn't have to worry about, about trying to. Right. Right. Trying to spoon feed. He's like, no, I'm going to give you the whole picture. Like, I'm not a, um. Like what Oprah was doing for OWN. Mm -hmm. When she left, what was that, ABC? Whatever she left. Yeah, I mean, yeah. People were like, Psh, that ain't gonna work. It ain't gonna work. It ain't gonna work. Yeah. It she, ain't she, gonna she work. Had, she had some haters when, when she went to create OWN. Right. The, own, the network. Now, I mean, she had the vision, but how many haters did she have? A whole bunch. What if all those, you know, a lot of haters were us. Now, it's like a rumbling behind the scenes. In a minute, OWN is going to be, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But if, own, if Oprah was a white man, <laughs> believe me, it wouldn't have been, she shouldn't have done that. She ain't mm -hmm. going to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Even from, you know, yeah, yeah. even from her own psyche. Right, right. So how, how how do we how do we how how do we deal with the the years and years of being fed this crazy narrative? Because um, it can't change overnight, right? You have I mean you have four hundred you have a lot of time where the narrative has been poured into not a, let alone other races, but into your own race. Um, how, how, did, did the cast book, did she, between me reading cast and white fragility? Yeah, I haven't read that one yet. Those are two books. Everybody should be required to read everywhere in the United States is coming up through the educational system because it will, it will peel back the onion skin of what you think, you know, versus what hasn't been told mm -hmm. <clears throat> another thing that got me from the book was no else in the united no else in the nowhere else in the globe are people of african descent known as being black hmm. you're only black in the united states if we go to africa we're from whatever tribe we're what are you, Yoruba? What is it, mm -hmm. Yoruba? Mm -hmm. No one's black in Africa. Mm -hmm. You're from your, you're what tribe you are. Yeah. People of European descent that came here as immigrants, they were not white. They were Irish. They were French. They were German. They weren't white until they, until they started buying in to the caste system.
then they became white. Otherwise, they were just as low level immigrants as we were, just they came freely versus mm -hmm. being brought. I mean, I'm telling you, it was like, whoa. <laughs> so how can all these people from other nations that are not Americans, because none of us are American, you know, Native Americans. Yeah, we're, not, we're not the indigenous right. people. All these other people were what, what they were until they came to America. Then they became white. And then, then they could see and start treating people that were brown beneath them because it's, it's a natural order of the psyche that someone will have to be, you know, someone's got to be at the bottom of the rung, someone's got to be at the top, but we were deemed at the bottom only because you were born that way. Not mm. that you earned being at the bottom. Wow. So did she say what the solution is though? No, but I think part of the, I'm going to say no. Part of her solution is opening up your eyes to what's already around you that you can't see. Then you're able to, you know what? That's casteism. That's not necessarily racism. That's casteism. And then you talk about and then you educate. That's why I don't want Jaden and Lathan to read the book. Because then you start to understand and see how this isn't just this isn't just haphazard yeah. we, that we are where we are. Some of the things we've been able to overcome, but some of the things, I mean, that came from the caste system, some of the things we've been able to, been able to overcome because of um, education or whatever, mm -hmm. or opportunity, but some things are still very prevalent. We still don't own a piece of, prop excuse me, piece of property other than our house. Well, there's a reason for that. There's a reason why, you know, the, there's a reason behind redlining and all of it mm -hmm. and that. And then the, um, I forget what year, what years, but the, the home, um, it's like a homeowner's act. Yeah. Where federal dollars were put in place to help people buy their first homes. But those federal dollars were not put in place for black people to buy their first homes. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. It was, and the same thing with farmers. When we were watching about watching um, Shades of America, isn't it Shades of America? Yes. Mm -hmm. How a farmer can put in for federal aid and, and for his farm and his application can take two months or no, his application can take a year for it to go through the system. Yeah, yeah. But then a white farmer's application can take a month. Well, that's designed that way so they can end up taking that land because you can't wait a year Not for right. federal help. It's just, but I think back to what we we're talking about, the civil unrest and the, and the, this is not unrest. It should not have been at rest any, we never should have been complacent, but you're complacent when you're not educated. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know. You can't fault somebody. Let me say, you can't fault somebody for not knowing. Yeah. And the public school system. No, they're not going to teach it. No one's teaching it. No one's going to teach it. I didn't even have a black studies until I got, when I got to college. And it was an elected, not a requirement. Because the true story, they don't want it to be so told. It doesn't want they don't want, I mean, that's a very ugly side of America. Very, very ugly. And they're not willing to face what happened. It was to the point where in the book that um, she was saying that if what slave owners did to slaves, like you weren't, there was one slave owner <laughs> to where he was mad with his slave because the slave plowed the rows and the rows were crooked. And the slave owner brought it to his attention, mm -hmm. to the slave's attention. The rows are crooked. The slave said to the slave owner, same plants grow on a crooked row as a straight row. 
He whipped him, tied him to a post, and then put salt and pepper, doused him in salt and pepper. So it was literally, don't look at me in my eyes, don't say anything back. The, the, all the don'ts that, in order not to die. So it's like, if that happened for somebody to this, right now, they would be up, made such a uh, example, and they'd be all over the news, going to jail. I mean, that's say. I mean, it's like, come on. Well, but, but that's serial killing. That's you know what I mean. But they're doing worse. They're killing. That's what I'm saying. They're shooting folks. I mean, what's what's the, what's the difference? There is no difference. There's no difference. But if it was okay, then. Hmm. There's still some of, well, there's some, inherently, we're just now getting to the point of saying, these people are of value because they're human, not because just they're black. Yeah. Because what human would do that to another human? Hmm. Look at history. Right. Look at history. What human would do that to another human? History tells you what human would do it. Yeah, that that is a uh, uh, the interesting uh, that that fear. I don't know. I, I I don't know if it's it's the fact that there's a fear that they don't want that folks don't want to to discuss um, what what the past was and what their ancestors did, or whether they want to be in denial. About how I think it's all a little of everything, but how egregious the more people you educate about it, but you, gotta, you can't hide it. You can't hide it. Uh, that's a, I mean, I, and, and this is by no means a statement to make it right, but the, say say you you grew up as a uh, a white person in the suburbs. Right, kind of, you no know, privileged life and everything, and and then you're in your mid thirties to forties, and all of a sudden, someone comes to you with an album book of of data of information about your granddaddy, your uncles, and it, I mean, and it explicitly called by name, pictures, and everything, so this is, and you begin to see everything that was done and that, that they did, that's a huge pill to swallow. And you begin to think about, is, your, is everything that you've been raised on a lie? But if it is, call it for the lie. Call it for the lie. And do better. Gotcha. Yep. Yep. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's just. And so it's, it, it almost feels like some folks just want to say, you know what? Stop and just move on. The stuff that. A lot of folks want. It just feels like that a lot of folks want to say, can you please. You can just, just get over it. Just get over it. Get over it. Mm -mm. You can't get over it when. None of this was accidental. <laughs> it was, it, it All was of this designed. was very designed and formulated to keep a certain class of people, race of people, in a certain space. But what they didn't bank on was people being able to have opportunity to get out of that space. Hmm. They thought what they, and it should have been, it should have been annihilation. It should have been. Just like certain indigenous people, just, you know, a virus comes and wipe everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It really, I mean, the stuff that I've read in between the African American Museum and between what our, our grandparents didn't say, but you knew that was something that 
was terrible. I remember um, going to Mobile, Alabama with my father and my stepmother in a van, you know, family trip. Not, um, she's from, well, like I said, Mobile. And I remember all of a sudden, uh, and I was maybe seven, seven or eight. So this is what, 19? 1979? Yeah. 79, 80. I remember um, dad pulling over the car and just everybody was told, don't move and don't look. Well, you tell a kid, don't move and don't look. What am I? I was. And that was the first time I had ever seen Klansmen marching with the hoods on and everything. And I still didn't know what it was. But my parents knew. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, reflecting on that. What could have happened? But even when we drove away, once the Klan uh, parade was over past us, we just drove like, you know, just, well, back on our trip. It wasn't like this was an event that we need. <laughs> it was just like, well, another day in because this, this is where we're at. We're in Alabama. And this mm-hmm. is 1979. And then she was saying there was another act of like 2013 um, where it just recently, like in 2013, or it was the 2000s, that they took a law off the book in, either, in one of these you know, southern states that interracial marriage wasn't against the law. In the 2000s, right. this just got rescinded. So do you think it's, it's so ingrained that it won't change? No, I think it can change. I think it can change, but I think that, you know, a lot of that, it will change with awareness and it'll change by people actively doing something. I mean, if I, you, I, I'll say, go ahead. If people continue to, well, I don't do that, you know, well, mm-hmm. no, it takes a collective acknowledgement that this is not going to happen anymore and we can't just keep waiting for people to age out of the system you know there are going to be it, it's more effective for a, a racist person to change his ways than to die because <laughs> if you die all the other little racists you've been raised are still but if you're there and you change and you make an example of I was wrong. I need to, I need to change. And in everything I do recognize yeah. what I need to stop and what I need to do. Cause I think that's what we're waiting on is we, you know what everybody that was in the, you know, forties, fifties, sixties, whatever, that's still that way. We're just waiting for them to die. No. Oh no. But it, and it's obvious that it, it's, it's still there. Mm-hmm. It's still there. But so <laughs> I mean, when I asked that question, I was uh, thinking of it, thinking of the answer myself. And, and um, my answer, my answer would be it, it, it will change in God's time. Um, because God can allow the scales on someone's eyes, their heart and everything to remain. Mm-hmm. And really he's the only one that can remove it. Not to say that not, and, and, and not wanting that, that statement meaning for us to do nothing because he can use us to help remove those scales. Mm-hmm. But it's really truly in his time. Of when it's he in his time fit. and God gives you choice. Mm-hmm. If you choose not to see it. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, I, and I really thought that the NBA's, you know, protests and lockout would be, or not lockout, but 
would be longer than a day. I prayed it was going to be long. I was like, you know what? I'm so proud that you're doing it, but a day? I really, and I don't know what the collective decision was or whatever, but I know more things would change if they decided, you know what? Forget COVID. We just ain't playing until you do this. Unless the owners came to the table with some significant. They would have had to do something first. A check would have to be written and cashed and moved to a different account in a different country <laughs> and everything else before I would play. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. And it, it's, but it's, it's easier said than done. Well, that's the thing. I don't think it is. I really don't think it is. Look at John Lewis. If he had taken the mentality of, him, I'm only one person, then what have, would have, what, all that he achieved would never happen if he took the mentality of, I, it's only just me, I can do it. I can't do it because it's only just me. Now, granted, there are people who are willing to sacrifice a whole lot more than others. But I look at how many people around the world that have made change they were one person. Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. And I think LeBron, if he had to say, you know what? I got all y'all. We're going to sit this out. It only takes one person, but we need a person. You know what I mean? We, everyone, everyone collectively needs a leader of some kind in order to make a decision, in order to. There has to be some type of leader. And the thing is, is are you willing to be that leader? Hmm. Because it's going to take, believe me, you're going to be under attack. There will yeah. people who are not strong enough that will drop out. Yep. But there will also be other people. Because like Colin Kaepernick, he even fell off and fell on the knife. How long ago? And now everybody's kneeling and wearing T-shirts. <laughs> but don't just kneel and wear a T-shirt. Be intentional about your change. Be intentional. Put some money on it. Yeah. Puff cuff, the little that we have, we always, if we put our if we put our mouth, if we put it in our mouth, we put money on it. It's like when all that stuff went down at um in Atlanta mm -hmm. and I got on um Instagram giving my piece on what I felt yep. was wrong or right. You can disagree with me all day long. But we all got to agree something has to change. Mm -hmm. So what's going to change? Yeah. I didn't know how, didn't know what. But we took a couple thousand dollars and gave it to, we gave, I think, three entities, 2,500 apiece or something like that. Yeah. For Brianna, the, the people who are frightened for Brianna. Um, I forget, I don't want to say off the top of my head. But my thing is, I don't care if it's $100. I don't care if it's $50. I don't care if it's five. I don't care if it's your time. Do something. Don't just talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Amen. No. Amen. <laughs> Let the church say amen. <laughs> Let the church say amen. Wow. Okay. So where, where are we at in time? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Um, it's, 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 it's challenging times and, and I was reflecting on on everything and having the race three sons um, and it feels like I'm constantly answering this question from my youngest why are the police always killing black folk? Mm -hmm. And I have to, and I answer him by, I'm like, son, I don't know why. Um, not all police are bad. Um, and the ones that are killing black folk unarmed are the bad ones, and they're making it bad for the collective. 
um, just to try to help him understand um, the situation that's going on, and and I you know and also trying to have conversations with my two oldest and. Sometimes I feel that they don't fully grasp the uh, severity. Um, I know for sure one truly believes that he's invincible and that uh, nothing would happen to him, whether it's COVID, whether it's police, whether it's you know, anything. Um, and the other one... Lathan kind of thinks about it, and Lathan always questions. He's, the I mean, I think he's becoming more um, acceptable to what's what's hap what he's seeing, what he's hearing, what he's experiencing, and and having second thoughts um, about his actions. And uh, but it's 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 a, it's a, it's it, it's a, it's a challenge. It is. Literally a, a, a fear of, and I never thought I would have been be in a situation where I would literally fear and think that I won't see my son when he returns. You know, I won't see him return. Um, I never thought I would be in that situation because we've tried to do everything in our power to put him in an environment and in, in a, uh, a situation to where that would, that likelihood would be less likely. Well, um, the thing is, there's some, there's just, there's a lot of naivety. Is that the word? Naivety? Naive, not that's nativity. That's, 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 that's probably what you said the first time. <laughs> You are a 17 year old that's been raised in a bubble oh. that, you know, we used to see firsthand Ray Ray or cousin Kiko, uncle, Kiko, whatever, <laughs> making a wrong decision and having the consequences of it. Yeah. We moved away from, you know, Big Mama's house that has the, the, the suspect uncle that lives in the basement. <laughs> you know, we moved away from all of that to now you're in a neighborhood with a whole bunch of transplants. You're, you know, and you did it for what you thought was the betterment of whatever, yeah. better school district, better this, that, and the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're living with people who all are living in the same bubble. So no one knows the reality. Our kids don't re know the reality of this is what happens when you do make a stupid decision, or this is what happens when you make a stupid decision, but you're innocent, there's some innocence in it because you just don't know better. Yeah. But because you're black male in the South, there's no room for anybody. You're not given a benefit of the You're not doubt. given the benefit of the doubt. Well, he's only 17. Right. And what's coming to light is this is all over the world, you know, all over the United States. You're not given the benefit of the doubt. No one's going to wait for you to talk. No one's going to ask you who your parents are. No one's going to ask you, to, you know, were you at Wednesday night Bible study? Right. You are a black man, even though you are a boy mm -hmm. in the United States. So this is like that young man who was walking with the hoodie and the mask on because the cold air would give him... Yep and ends up dead. First of all, that's casism right there. Who calls the police for somebody walking with a hoodie and a mask? Walking down the street with a bag of groceries with a hoodie and a mask on. The only way they got called, he got called is because he, he got called on because he was black. So it wasn't that he was walking down the street in a hoodie and mask looking in windows. And who walks down the street with a hoodie and a mask and groceries and is on the sidewalk planning on, what you planning on? Right, how, how does that how, equate? How is he a threat? Right. How is he a threat? How does that, that make, only reason why he was a threat 
is because he had brown skin, which he couldn't control the fact that he was born with brown skin. I guess, but my... So the victims of the cast were everybody involved. The person who called, 